All right. Hi, everybody. We're at the AT Town Hall. We're doing announcements before we jump into our topic for the day. Um, our special event, members of the Quiet Leadership Team, there's Brian ready to go. There's Kelly ready to go. There's everybody else ready to join the fun. We don't know what Mia's doing yet, so just keep an eye on Mia's box as you watch this recording. Um, there's a lot happening there. I don't know what, but something's going down. Uh, I wanted to remind everybody of special events before we start our conversation today. We have multiple special events coming up. We have, by popular demand, the groups the group requested it, and I made it happen. We have Hillary coming on April 17th to talk about AT supports for mental health. That will be our topic on the 17th of this month. Oh, we're not even in April yet. In, in April. April 17th, uh, we have the book study we all agreed to, which was the Better Conversations, uh, Jim Knight book. We have those scheduled for one time per month for the next five months. And that's how we'll approach that book. So we'll do it as a little kind of a longer book study. Uh, so we have uh, chapters one and two on April 10th, chapters three and four on May 8th, Chapters 5 and 6 on June 12th, Chapter 7 and 8 on July 10th, and Chapter 9 on August 14th. And you might say to me, well, that's weird, Mike. I don't work in the summer. And I'm going to say right back to you, that's okay. A lot of us do. And maybe even if you can just even pop in for part of that conversation, maybe we'll, uh, we'll have those summer conversations um, a little shorter. And if you know ahead of time, maybe you can uh, plan to be part of the discussion on those days. So those were my reminders from my piece of paper. I'm throwing out to get it off my desk. All right, with that said, here we are, special event, chatting with members of the Quiet Leadership team. They are going to talk about the indicators and the book study and everything, everything quiet. How about that? Brian, you like that? Everything quiet? I don't know. Everything quiet. Everything so I'm quiet. just gonna sit here and remain quiet. There you go, so everything quiet. So without, uh, Further ado, I will say to you guys, how do you want to start our conversation? Thanks for coming back. So, <laughs> Kelly's like, Kelly's like all right, everybody start talking. <laughs> yes, I'm passing it off to Brian. <laughs> so we've uh, we've been excited with the conversations that have been happening within the Quiet Blue Book Study uh, Facebook group. Um, there's been a lot of uh, interesting conversations up until this point, uh, we have covered uh, chapters one through three and are currently discussing chapter four. So uh, if you're not familiar intimately with the Quiet Blue Book. Um, <laughs> Let me uh, pull it off a pile on my desk. <laughs> which is on a pile on my desk. Um, I, uh, chapter one is an introduction. Chapter two is the quality indicators for AT consideration. Chapter three is quality indicators for AT assessment. And chapter four, which is what we're currently discussing, are quality indicators for including assistive technology in the IEP. Um, and because I'm doing it, I have and IFSP, um, because I think there's uh, some uh, interesting differences and similarities between the two processes. Um, what, uh, what's exciting is that we've shared a lot of uh, great information. There's been some uh, good discussions. We have some challenges going on this week, like how does your IEP system scaffold assistive technology documentation? Um, because we know training is important, but we also know that people tend to be prompt dependent. Um, if they see something, they're going to respond to that prompt. So is it a good prompt for assistive technology? Is it something that needs to improve? Um, uh, we talk a lot about policies and procedures. What are the policies and procedures in your uh, systems that are supporting um, good assistive technology practices. So I'd like to open up the floor. I can talk, um, that's not a problem. Um, and, but uh, I'd like to open up the floor and kind of talk about, you know, with regard to consideration, AT assessment, AT in the IEP and IFSP, what are some of, uh, what are some of the things that um, are going well 
in your neck of the woods? What are some of the things that might need some attention and what questions do people have? Great starters. I love that. I, you know, I could talk about this, this topic all day long. So I'm excited for people to jump in. I do want to acknowledge that Mia has joined the group. Mia, we were staring at the back of your head, then you walked away, you drifted into your virtual background. I was captivated by your total lack of attention to us. And I appreciate that. <laughs> I, you know, um, duty calls, as they hey, say. I <laughs> so, um, and I, and I will, I will um, take the opportunity to say that as many times as I can on a recording um, that you have, Mike. Um, so yes, I had to definitely do my duty and my, my work. Um, and, uh, yeah, and I'm back here. That's good. This is I just wanted duty, to know I was talking, this I was is where the duty about, is. Yeah, this is where that's the where the duty is. Now, is. So. I gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> Mia, I couldn't not talk about you as you were doing that. I was like, what is she doing? <laughs> but actually it's funny. I'll echo Mia's comment from the chat about, um, being at not as connected to the to book study, I have the same struggle, Mia, is that I am not a Facebook person. And so I put it back on my phone for this, but I don't have enough of a routine yet to remember to go back there. And I just thought of it this morning when I knew we were going to talk about this. I'm like, ah, I should have gone there and looked. So I'm excited to check back in. I will make more of an effort as well to get in there. And Brian, actually, I, you know, I'm just going to start it off with that. Like I like, and, and Kelly, like I realized, I mean, it, it is such an opportunity and I know Facebook is so good for groups and, and it, it's just amazing. I'm just wondering, like, I know that Facebook and Instagram can be linked. And a lot of us who don't do Facebook do Instagram, like, like you can link the accounts and, and I'm just wondering maybe for next time, I really hope there's a next time because like I said, I have just kind of fallen off the apple cart with this one and I, I would love it. Like, I, I think, I think Facebook is wonderful, but I think it also could maybe be a barrier. Um, if there is a consideration for, um, for maybe like doing that. So like people can at least get the questions, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like, or, or get the questions in another, uh, like another format and then with the dates to just hop on Facebook for the conversation or something because I gotta tell you like I really think what you guys are doing and I love quiet um and I and in this chapter is you know fantastic like there's so many things here that did you Kelly did you hear my Wisconsin come out there um <laughs> It, it doesn't come out very often, but um, yeah, like this is this is really good stuff, especially um, uh, with schools struggling right now, um, just uh, serving, um, you know, um, serving our um, disabled population and and others. Yeah, I agree with Matt. I agree with me a thousand percent. Yeah, I'm going to do better at it too, Matt. I agree. Um, Kelly comments in the chat, she'll be speaking Jersey by the end of the week. I can only hope that I have that effect on you when I see you. Oh, for um, sure. I can only It's already hope. happened. And yes. I keep getting reminded by my Wisconsin family. Yeah. Uh, I think that, yeah, Mia, I think we do hope that there's a next time. And we know that there was so much that we were going to learn this for this first time through with Alyssa's help. Where, like Alyssa yeah. really fed us a lot of great information as we got started. And so I think things like, linking it to Instagram, um, maybe sending some more messages out to the email list mm -hmm. for the list, um, the quiet list. We just did a reminder about that we were, because there were a bunch of questions about IEPs going on. And so I just kind of, hey, we're, we're also talking about this. And we also have linked it to our live presentations. So we had, I would say 200 people in the room at ATIA. Um, when we had this I, this topic, IEP, and we saw some really great sharing that people from Maryland talked about how, you know, they don't just have the one question on their IEP with a checkoff. They've got, the, what, what is it, five questions that they have. And if you answer this way, then this, then this, um, more like a, a flow chart type yeah. of thing. Like a so decision we tree almost. People, yeah. Yeah. There's, having people share that way. And so I'm really hoping that you know, we can be can gather those things up into a repository. You know, some things people have already shared that are on the the quiet resource bank. But I think we're you know what we'll do as we get through all of these chapters is really take a look at 
boy, what do we have as a result of it? I think that's a really good point. I like that. I, I like that idea of reminders back to the list because I do see those emails every day. And so that would help. I also wonder if there isn't some way to um, ask some question prompts for each chapter through like a Google form on those announcements. Because I know if I saw that form come, I would click it instantly and give my three cents on everything. And then at least that could be part of the conversation. Um, and then I wouldn't feel, because I'm actually feeling guilt that I'm not there because I wanted to be there and I wanted to be part of it. And then I forget constantly. Alyssa, why are you raising your hand? That is so positive <laughs> and so nice. Go ahead. I'm, I'm raising my hand because I'm driving. So I didn't want to unmute uh, early and have road noises join Fair. the conversation while you were Fair. talking. Go ahead. So um, I, multiple things. One is I learned the most on round one of my book study. Mm -hmm. So I like, to me, this is about failing forward and not that it was a fail, but like that, that everything that you uh, learn or experience it to me, it, so that's part of it. A, like, if I look back at my round one, I kind of go, why did I do this, this, or this? <laughs> and then the second piece of it is to me, this is no different than what we preach with UDL, right? This is, thanks, Mia. This is multiple, <laughs> means, of, multiple means of expression and, and representation, right? So we have tried with, our, with my book study. Okay, we did Facebook group studies. I've done offline group studies. I've done a little bit of Instagram. To me, you're not going to catch everybody with one modality, right? Like that's no different than, than, than instruction in a classroom. And I think when, when, when you throw the largest net out there, right, mm -hmm. where, where maybe it's a five pronged approach where some people are going to dive in and be good on Facebook. Some people want Instagram, some people would do a Google form mm -hmm. and participate that way. Some people would do that old school, you know, quiet listener. So to mm -hmm. me, it's about We've learned a lot from round one. Let's figure out how do we take what worked and move it forward and then adapt in the places that we saw the most conversation. Do we build out more activity in that area? Because we know it's a hot topic like AT and the IEP. Exactly. That, that's such a good point, Alyssa. And happy birthday, by the way. Thanks. Uh, today is a crazy day, so I'm just postponing all birthday celebrations until I'm uh, uh, in New Jersey. So just be ready. We're going to. Wow. OK, that's really it's setting my the bar. Present, it's my present to myself is to go to New Jersey. So uh, I figured Monday is it's just a work day. You know, yeah. we were supposed I, to be off initially, but then the hurricanes came through. So they took this day back. Yeah. Well, I, I'm glad, I, I would encourage everyone to think about New Jersey as your birthday destination and celebration place, because that's how much fun we have here. Um, well, I mean, it was a nice convenient place. Uh, right. I mean, I, I'm, I'm very excited about it, but- So I, that's what uh, we got, convenience is why you chose. All right, that's fair, I guess. <laughs> but yeah, I agree I'm going to a Wawa. I just know that's uh, good. You should. I think we should all go to a Wawa when we're there. Yes, I agree. I'm uh, missing Wawa. All right, we can fix that. Um, but yeah, I like Alyssa's idea of kind of the big net, the wide net um, of all these different spots and thinking, um, because I, I think it's so important to hear all these different perspectives of it. I, I think bringing us back to some of the conversation, um, I just did a presentation last week to a principals and administrators group. And they wanted me to do a presentation on AT devices. And I was not really interested in that uh, because they had all other presentations on devices. And they were asking me to go last in the, in the day. And I said, can I instead do a session called Now What? And you had all this conversation about technology all day. Now what? Now what do you do at this point? Um, and we spent time talking about the indicators for consideration and implementation. And I'm like, look, has anyone heard of the quiet indicators? And I will let you guess how many people in the room knew. There, I'll tell you there were two AT consultants in the room and maybe 40 administrators. And there were probably about 40 online as well. So how many people besides myself do you think knew? Two, the other two AT consultants knew. Myself and the other two AT consultants. Um, everyone else, this was brand new information. 
And so we went through the indicators one at a time uh, for consideration, kind of having that as a conversation point and then discussing. Um, and and I, I was so quick to remind them like, look, yes, AT has to be considered in every IEP, regardless of, of disability type of disability or severity. Do you do that? And what does everybody do? Them? Of course we do that. And then I point out that one word that I love in all the indicators, which was consistently. Are you consistently doing this? And then everybody had like kind of a moment and I saw people turn in their head and chat with someone else. Um, and I think that's the part that makes people remember things. I think that's really important. Go ahead, Mia, jump in. I just have a question. Um, so there was something that was brought up in Florida, like maybe two, like a year ago in an AT. Um, Alyssa, remind me because you were on the AT um, passport to learning also um, about best practices. And we use the Wadi. We like, like the, we talk about the Wadi, we talk about the quiet, um, quiet indicators. And then someone at one point said one of those was not okay or did not have the research to be used anymore. And I'm just wondering from you guys um, if you've heard anything about that. And then like when you get with a group and you're talking about quiet versus wadi, you see what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. what, like why do the quiet folks, like what do you guys basically say is your Dif like your differential like wh what are the what are the what are the the benefits slash barriers of using the quiet versus like the wadi etc so if uh, i'll take that one because i answer this question a lot um i really see them as two different tools because quiet is all about services right it's and that's when you know when they got together and started working on the quality indicators it was because everybody's focus was on the tools. And that's what WADI, I mean, every section of the WADI is about the tools, except for like the overall assessment piece and the end of the implementation piece. But all the other sections are all tool-based strategies. So where quiet really fills the gap is that, you know, we it's, it's focused on AT services, which is also part of the definition that many people forget about, right? And as far as research behind them, um, you know, well, it kind of like that written right in it is the first six indicators were done as a part of Joy's, Joy Zabala's research. Brian has done research on the quiet list. Um, and, but as far as Wadi goes, I don't know that there's a research base behind that other than their experiential use and reworking it. I mean, that the, the Wadi areas have been around for over 25 years, almost parallel to as long as quiet's been around. But I really go to that more for the tools aspects of things, not what I'm trying to evaluate my services piece of it all. So it sounds like, Kelly, like you feel like they can be work used together almost, but that like instead of using the two parts of the Wadi, there's only two parts that really focus on the services, maybe use the use the quiet for the services and then the, the wadi for the tools. And Joan's got, you know, she also does a lot in this area too. Um, the two parts in the wadi that are about assessment or planning are very student individualized versus when we talk about assessment and implementation in quiet, we're usually talking about broader aspects of how those services are provided overall not just planning for one individual student. So and and I, I would agree completely with what Kelly's saying. One of the things that's important to realize is that the work from Wadi was really instigated and driven by Dr. Penny Reed, who is a founding member of Quiet. And if you look at the work in Quiet and the work in Wadi, they are going to supplement each other. They're not gonna contradict each other. They're going to, you know, here we're looking at students, here we're looking at systems. And you can't, in, in my way of thinking, you can support an individual student, but it's not going to be sustainable unless you have a system that's broad-based enough to serve all kids. So just as Mike talked about 
that whole thing about consistently. You know, if you implement Wadi or Wadi, you know that you're serving this kiddo well. If you implement quiet, you're taking care, you know, you're serving all kids well. And that's a gross generalization. I acknowledge I'm really good at, you know, you know, thinking about when we have pink unicorns all over the place and everyone does things well. Um, so just, they do not contradict each other. They do support each other and they're going to help us be better practitioners. Yeah, my recollection of part of that conversation in, in, in our parts of the world was, I believe, a, a fundamental lack of understanding what those two were by the people who were adamantly against them. Um, out of either that or some other things, we did have a work group that was looking at how is assistive technology um, documented in our what, our, what is our statewide IEP? We made suggestions, we came up with an entire kind of decision tree. And I believe this is year four that it's sitting with DOE waiting to be approved. So um, we're kind of in, in my neck of the woods, I've gone with, we have two questions, which is two more than we did have. We used to have the traditional, like, has AT been considered? And they check it, they don't check it. They basically have to check something. Um, and then the second question, which is new in our peer version three and needs to be better trained by me, I'll take the onus on that, is um, does this student require accessible educational materials? And that is not a question that we previously had in any of our IEPs. And it's bringing about a lot of conversation. What is that? What does that look like? How do I know whether to check the box? Um, so it's, it is helping us to have discussions about question one when they get to the next question because they're very, as we know, intricately linked that usually a student who needs assistive technology in some means needs alternate material formats in order to access whatever they're accessing. Um, but until that decision tree gets kind of folded into peer, which Last I asked, I was told the next set of updates which are in June and July, but I've been told that for a couple of years, so not hold my breath or I'd be anoxic at this point. Um, but I, I think it was a, a misunderstanding of what, what the tools purposes are, kind of like you were saying. Um, and, and I do think that some of the court cases that have come down lately will help push things in that direction. Um, whether it will, I, I think, uh, Florida will be the 50th seat for that push to happen in. Uh, everybody else will get done before we will. Um, but, but it is driving some conversation, just having the aim question there, mm -hmm. which again, that has, that's, that's only been the last little bit that that's been there. Um, and I know, think anything, check, go ahead. anything, Alyssa, that drives more conversation and doesn't doesn't facilitate that kind of just rote checking of that first box, right? That's just becomes rote checking. Oh, I, I know I got to check that. That's a yeah, question they you, don't even know that they've needed to think about until that moment. Correct. Perhaps. If you check the AT box or you check the AIM box, in other places, it says in big red letters, remember you need to ensure it like in the present levels and goals, but mm -hmm. there's no cross check to make sure that actually happened. It's just a big red reminder on the top. It's not like it looks for the word assistive technology in the text. And if you didn't do it there, then it's not there. It's just on any page where assistive technology could be. And that's true for, does the student have communication needs? Is the student's deaf, hard of hearing or visually impaired? Any of those special considerations that you check it does give you kind of a big glaring message on the, the pages where you could document. Again, it's progress. It's not where I would like it to be, um, but I think it's bringing about a lot of discussions that we didn't have before because people, people thought, oh, well, if they, if they want an audio book or they want to read by ear, that's assistive technology. And I'm like, well, then how are they getting the material and how are they accessing it? And they're going, oh, wait. So if they're using something different to do that, if they're using Snap and Read, I said, if that's their only means of getting the material in for them, that is assistive technology. Um, so it's driven some good conversations, but um, definitely not where we, where I would like them to be yet. But definitely a step in the right direction for sure. I like that, yeah.
I'm assuming you're not driving anymore, right? Okay, just checking. <laughs> Correct. I some... just, our our building is a big, gigantic metal building. So if I attempt to walk in, um, I, it, I will lose you. So I'm I'm trying to time it correctly. Upset. Just checking. Yeah, Someone so had to check. <laughs> next to other cars. All right. Carry on. <laughs> carry on. Yeah, I think this is this, this is good conversation, Brian. What are some of the people saying on the on the group? Like, what do you what do you what are you hearing as people are having this conversation online? So um, generally, uh, in the online conversations and uh, and it, it, the conversations, you never know what's going to hit fire, um, uh, and and what's going to um, uh, kind of excite people. Um, uh, but you know, in looking at what people are saying, you know, and they are talking about differences um, and not between their systems and other systems, mm -hmm. what their systems are, are doing. And we find that there's a lot of variability in how systems are actually focusing on assistive technology, whether that be in consideration or assessment or documenting within the IEP. Um, you know, uh, I have a personal fascination in language um, and, and how specifically language is, is being used in order to help facilitate um, uh, good um, assistive technology practices. Um, uh, the, the types of terminology we use, um, the degree to which we are on the same page um, as whether or not assistive technology means the same thing to everybody. Um, uh, and so there's uh, and there's pieces that that come in to play. I'm I'm dying. Lisa Antley from uh, North Carolina had uh, posted um, about her system uh, that is being used, the ECAT system for documentation in North Carolina, which sounds phenomenal in terms of the types of things that it does. Some of the things that she highlighted is when they when they go to um, when they go to document uh, AT um, uh, on the special factors, it says, you know, does the student need AT? If so, then uh, it's also connected to present levels of accommodations. Um, and for each goal that is written, they indicate whether or not assistive technology is needed and who's going to, and what supports are needed within the context of that goal. I, I want I, I want screenshots. I want to see what they're doing because it sounds like a very well integrated system. And I come from uh, systems that are using a system that we only have the special considerations question, and it's it's documented differently in some places. It is stated as, um, I, you know, have you considered AT versus does a student need AT, which are two fundamentally different questions. That uh, and that prompt uh, that prompt answers. Um, I think the variability is one of the things that uh, that people are still kind of uh, shocked about um, as we go from state to state or even within the states, different systems. I'm curious, how many people on the call have a statewide system? We have a statewide recommended form, and then we have lots of local stuff. You got to ask another question for my head starts hurting from shaking it now. <laughs> no, no, I think that's, that becomes a big, a big concern. And Brian, the instant you said that about that North Carolina system, I, I wrote myself a note, and I want to know everything there is about how they did that. What is that? What's the process? What was the factor in that whole scenario that allowed it to go forward and, and push that forward? Because again, the, this whole idea of us talking about consideration is not a surprise to anyone. It shouldn't be, right? But, it's, it, but it always stops just after, in, in my experience here, it always stops right after that. Well, of course we have to do that. Okay, well then let's do it. How are we all doing that? And we're and all I, doing it a little differently. And I think I'm thinking along the same lines as you, Mike, because it's about, you know, how did they do that? Who was the yeah. champion? Was it someone internal to the system? Was it a parent advocacy group? Was it there, you know, how did they get that done? Because many of us have tried mm -hmm. 
And, you know, my head hurts from banging it against the wall so often, right. um, both as, you know, I mean, I was a supervisor in our state department of education. And whenever I said, AT, we have to have it. And they go, oh, that's nice, Joan. You just, <laughs> you just keep talking. Um, you know, and then we, we use primarily a, um, a private organization or a private company has, an, uh, has the IEP form for the state of Minnesota that something like 98% of the districts use it. So in essence, it's our state form. And, you know, I, I went and lobbied with them once I was a retiree and just, you know, parent advocate, you know, this is how we need. And they went, well, so I'll pat on the head again, Joan, you know, that's all you ever talk about. Well, duh, it's my job, you fools. Um, <laughs> But I, I think it still continues, at least for us, to be driven by uh, due process, which Alyssa mentioned. You know, when do we see the issues come up? Then they're going to worry about it. Right. And right. yeah, I agree. But I think that same that I, I do think along that same line, Joan, is that if you were to look at our states, each of us, and say, do you have this? Do you have a statewide parent group? Of course. And and we go through and we would all check these boxes that we have these organizations or champions in our communities. And yet we see one state have that level of success that mm -hmm. what was their magic ingredient? And, and going back to Jones, that idea of who was that champion that pushed that forward? Um, oh, that's so interesting to me. I could get lost down the weeds in that for hours. Just kind of think about that. Yeah, and, and and Mia, I'm I'm reading your your chat, Mia. That whole idea of you know we have organizations that are statewide, and yet there's no kind of singularity or uniformity to what is is delivered through forms and things like that. And I and I, you know, I don't know if I'm on. I don't know yet if I'm convinced that a statewide form is the best way because, right. like I said, I in dealing with these districts in the different districts and how they do things. Um, each is as individual as, you know, um, pardon the comparison, but literally a grain of sand, like they are all so different. Um, money drives a lot of what they decide to end up, what, what the student ends up with for AT. Um, Orange County is one of the fifth largest or whatever, in the top five um, largest districts in the whole labor market. And so- Mia, I think you dropped out. I'm just trying to get an, an, a visual from anyone else if Mia dropped out or if it was me. Oh, thank God. Like, hmm, I think my whole yeah, computer my, system has broken down. Back in. Yeah, there, you go. Back in. there you yeah, go. There you go. Yeah, it's, it's for, for some reason, it's my computer, whatever. But what I was going to say is Orange County, fifth largest, or it's in the top five largest districts in the United States, um, operates very differently than another district I serve, which is rural, um, Sumter County. Um, you know, and where they, um, their teachers were told that they can't use um, from the district, they were told to cease and desist on um, using um, donors choose to help um, provide tier one, um, you know, tier one uh, low tech, you know, universally designed um, supports to get into their classrooms so that they could get their students communicating or doing different things before like an OT or people, you know, you know what I'm saying? So it's, I don't know if, it, I don't know if one form would fit yeah. because I don't know if they can conform to that. Does that make sense? Like it makes so tons different. of sense. And I think that, yeah, the minute I, I think about that, yeah, I think that you could, you could easily line up a district next to each other and be like, well, I don't know that one district or one group would be able to navigate that universal form in the same way another group might. And then you have the same disparity going on anyway. It still hasn't helped solve the problem. And I think the one thing that they did do that was helpful that I'm looking for right now in my drive is come out with kind of IEP um, team expectations between mm -hmm. the AT specialist and the I other IEP team members. Um, I can't, I'm looking forward to my drive to put a, a link in the chat box, but um, it, it was kind of nice to be able to say like, this is the recommendation of our state. Um, uh, they kind of defined AT competencies um, that were expectations. So at least I could say to my district folks, this from the state is the guidance that we've been given and what your IEP team should know. Now, do my IEP team members have that level of knowledge yet? 
no. I mean, we're happy when we keep a teacher in the classroom, much less expect them to know A, B, or C, but at least it gives me a platform to say this is the reason why it's important to keep having discussions or offering professional development, even if it's on-demand professional development, so that there can be some, some building of skills so that you know, a, a team member could define AT and does know what's available and what our application is and, and doesn't come back with a, you know, we don't, we don't do that here right. kind of answer. Like, again, the expectations are different between what, what my role is and what, you know, a, another team member's role is, but at least to know enough to know enough. Yeah. But it's interesting, Alyssa, you know, it's that same idea. Now I'm searching my drive for something to complement your add to the chat it's that same idea of how do we get them to figure out do you do these same things here a lot of times people will say well we don't do that here because they don't have a nice sense of who everyone here is and the skills they have right and those kind of jagged skills that people have and it's like oh you know we've all been in there we've walked down a hallway and you ask a question and someone's like you know who you need to talk to Miss so-and-so down that other hallway, she's a whiz on that. And yet no one knows that beyond the person they're pointing to and the person that pointed you that way. So there are these pockets of knowledge um, that don't get recognized because we don't even ask those questions to them. And so I'll put in the Alt-Shift um, skills competency guide that we always point to, like, ask people, what are you comfortable doing? Like, what are some of the skills you have that I don't even know about? And then you can decide if you have those people. There you go. You know, one of the things that I think about a lot in my job, because we're supporting individuals across the state, and we think about breaking our technical assistance into tiers of mm -hmm universal targeted in intensive or universal is what we put out there ubiquitously for everyone and uh, we're in the process right now of developing a state ta guide or redeveloping a ta guide for the state um and my concern is always sort of the the integration of those supports in the places that people are going to be so, you know, when uh, when I'm thinking about um, AT consideration, you know, and I come from, uh, I, uh, I've worked with states, I've seen lots of good examples of AT consideration guides that are supplemental to what is on the IEP. Um, they're not integrated, they're not, uh, and they're not put in there um, and accessible somebody has to one know about it two know how to use it three uh, go out and get it and four actually put it into place that's a lot of friction a lot of asks. in making change yeah. and so thinking through you know what is it that we can do systemically to sit there and say you know here's at consideration here are some prompts right within the IEP system that's going to help you engage in good AT consideration. Um, or, uh, you know, here is, um, you know, here are other things like, uh, for example, in present levels. A simple question, is a student currently using assistive technology? If, if so, how's it going? You know, and to go ahead and make sure that that's incorporated in there just to prompt people in that context without any additional friction to, uh, to incorporate uh, what they need to do. Um, uh, my thoughts, anyway. Yeah, I love that thought, Brian. And I like that idea of that prompt to help them make those lasting connections. Like, oh, that doesn't matter right now, but oh, next time I see that, it's gonna make me think about that a little deeper and where do I need to make sure I'm acknowledging that if this student needed that in their plan. I think that's the part that becomes really important. Is a beast in the chat. I'm just going to say that a definite barrier, and I guess you guys all know this, is that um, the turnover rate right now is just, is just I, I just think that, you know, when I came into this role at Fiddlers eight years ago, we, I mean, even though I serve Orange County, that team had 
as you guys know, a lot of the people on that team, like um, even, you know, state like or nationwide, they had like such a strong team. And um, there was a lot of actually teams in Florida um, three years earlier that had such strong strength teams. And in the last 10, 10 years, what we've seen is a dissembling for some reason. They're like, mm, AT, we don't need that. So they're like, ah, we're just going to put you guys back in the classroom, or we're going to have one person run the AT program for an entire large district um, that's also doing work as an SLP. Um, and then we've had the people that have been doing it, the veterans that have been doing it forever, they're retiring. So we were like, we're kind of, I mean, I, Brian, you know, because you're supporting our work in, in Florida, like we're kind of starting from scratch in a lot of places. But when I say scratch, I mean, scratch and one person, like, 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 which is the worst of all possible, right. which is the worst of all possible situations. Right. Because um, and I don't, do you guys feel like, like Peyton, Lauren, like Lori, Joan, Kelly, um, Naomi, what are you guys seeing um, in your next of the woods? I mean, I've been in two states that that's happened to, right? So I were, I grew up on assistive technology in Pennsylvania where 20 years was invested in building teams uh, across the intermediate unit system. And then administrators, just like you guys were talking earlier, wouldn't let us say the word quiet. So anything that had to do, we weren't allowed to mention the quiet, we weren't allowed to mention Wadi. And so then it, it went dormant and people got reassigned. We all got changed from things like assistive technology specialists to educational specialists. And I, yes, I do know that this is being recorded. Um, and my job turned into shadowing building principals. And it was like, exit. And then I ended up here in Wisconsin where, you know, now 15 years ago, Wadi was defunded. And in both states and, and here in Wisconsin, it took a grassroots group, all volunteers to even get an eye back on assistive technology seven years ago. And it started with a SNAP grant of a person, a young gentleman with a disability that got it all going again. And then when the monies came through, actually, what was the when the COVID monies came through for, then Wisconsin started getting back on the map again. So I watched this happen twice, um, and and see how in Pennsylvania it got back on the map because of lawsuits, and they had you know they didn't have people in place, and so but but both administrations at those state levels said, oh we've done at, like we've done it. We've we've put twenty five. Great years job, into everyone! It, so like <laughs> now we're doing autism. Like that was that was Pennsylvania's <laughs> move. Like we've done AT. Now everybody's going to go to all the ABA trainings, and yes. you can talk to Susan McCluskey. She can tell you living through that. And then um, you know, and then here it was like, oh, Wadi, we've done that. We don't nobody. And now when I go to schools in Wisconsin, nobody's even heard of Wadi. They don't even know what that is. And the and and that would be from people who are being put into a slot, like the other duties as assigned. There's this thing called accessible education materials. What's that? So well, you used to have this whole project. <laughs> it goes but back it, to that, you know, and that that brings us all back full circle to that consistently comment. So in my session the other day, and I said that out loud, I said, you know, are you doing AT services for your students with disabilities, with IEPs? Well, of course we are. I said, okay, how about your students not with autism? How's that going? Would you answer that in the same way? Are you consistently doing that? If a student comes to your district with a physical disability, how does that go? Because I've seen that in, in, in towns that I've provided support to, where they're like, you know, I, I will send the, the quiet, the, the matrix say, you know, rate your, so where do you think you guys are at? And how can we make this better? And they'll rate it five. Um, and then I'll go in and I'll say, well, well, first of all, you're not a five um, because uh, you have this other student here with a different type of disability that is not receiving similar services. Um, and so your consistency is off. So right? Mike, when, 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 if you reconnect with this group, make sure you let them know that there'll be a chap or you know, a two week period all about in the book study about administrative support. Well, I, I, I hit that at the end, Joan, with this group. And I was like, hey, by the way, my thought is if I never come back, 
<laughs> so why not get it all out if I've done something that I'll never return? Um, and I pointed out at the end, I said, you know, as you go forward, some of your reflection as you leave today is how could I look at this as an administrative support and transition professional development? We talked about those other pieces that help you round out your services as you go forward. Um, yes. And surprisingly, I have heard from them and I am going to go back. Um, well, so that's exciting. I'm really, so that I'm really hoping when we do that section of the book study, we'll have some administrators. So we may have to go out and recruit a few yeah. who are really, really, really good champions, mm -hmm. getting back to that champion terminology. Um, so that we can have somebody saying, you know, here's here's this practice. What do you think? And have someone go, oh my God, I need to do that. And Mike, I think what you experienced where people rated themselves as a five, you know, we talk about that in the quiet leadership group all the time about how people don't know what they don't know. Right. Correct. So they'll you'll often see rather than this progression of, oh, maybe we were ones and twos and then we progress you see it go the opposite way like people are like oh we're banging on this and they're like four and five and then they get a little bit of training you're like oh gosh we're a two right you know, exactly there, there's a re there's a recentering of their score right exactly the other thing too kel that we do a lot is we'll ask people as part of our of, as part of this ex experience ask different stakeholders within your school to do this rating and then let's come together and talk about that because that's exactly it is you get you know a, a building principal who will say well we're a five and then you get a teacher in that same school who says we're a one there is clearly a disconnect there um and, and i don't know where you sit it might be somewhere around three or two or three or four it might be somewhere in there it might not be as good as the best things and as bad as the worst thought so it's somewhere in the middle but it's that idea of of having those voices have that conversation Sometimes that's enough of an eye opener for a discussion to break out. Hey, this is what we see. I, we I know really that when tried. Kirk and some of the leadership group went into New Hampshire, that those discussions in those school district teams were so valuable with the people who you know were rating things totally different. Yeah, and Sorry, we're still Lauren. doing that in New Hampshire with the groups. We're doing that now with our team. Same idea. Sorry, Lauren, go ahead. Oh, no worries. I just wanted to say we tried to build in some supports, like when you're reviewing new curriculum. And so we wrote up like a little checklist, like, did you check that this new math curriculum or this new science curriculum has accessible textbooks? Or did you do any like accessibility check on this? So um, we kept saying it's so hard to be the only one who people check in with when yeah. they think to even ask you, oh, like we just adopted this new English language arts curriculum. Like, is this, is this going to work? <laughs> and I'm like, well, you already bought it. You already put however many millions of dollars these curriculums are. Um, so we tried to make some documents because again, from the process perspective, if we have as our office of academics, if we have one form that everybody could kind of use when they're reviewing things and it's got that, like, is it NIMAS compliant? D is there anything about accessibility on their website? When you ask this question, how does the vendor respond, you know, and kind of build it in because they don't even know to ask. So at least if we can put the prompt in and then we, um, it's, it's a tough, ton of work. Um, but we have been invited to do to be on the teams when they do adopt the new curriculum, which is great. But we kept saying, <laughs> I know, we had, thank you. We because we kind of weaseled our way into a couple of these um, CLTs in different curriculum areas. And so now like the science people know us really well, and the math people know us really well. And, you know, so we have some really good partners, but not everybody's asking us. And so we needed some way to get that out so people would ask it even when we're not there. And we kept saying, there needs to be somebody that checks accessibility across the whole school division, everything on our, from our website to, you know, is it 508 compliant, like all these different things, because that's assistive technology for our community, not just our students. And is this accessible for our our teachers, you know, who, who may, from staff, we get a lot of staff questions and they say, oh, can I, you know, I, I just had to use my own computer for JAWS. And I'm like, you shouldn't use your own computer. You need to tell IT what computer you need that works with JAWS. You're probably the only user of JAWS as a staff person in our district. So 
you have to tell them. He says, I already did. And I said, keep telling them. Right. And how <laughs> valuable is that? Is that feedback from an actual stakeholder in your district? Like, look, I'm not talking about this imaginary person out in the community. I'm talking about me. Right. And I'm a member of our team and I can't do this. Right. So and I'm yeah. pro weaseling in, by the way, Lauren, I'm pro that. Anytime <laughs> you can weasel in, do that. We've um, drummed up too much business and now there's just three of us and we just can't, you know, it, Mia, you were saying like just one, but there's just three of us and we're, you know, a pretty decent sized district. We have 30,000 students and, you know, it's, it's a lot. And if we want to make headway on, on what we need to, plus we lost a little of ground, a little grounds after we came back from COVID. We so just back to make into you feel better, uh, Lauren, we're the same size and there's, um, I don't know, uh, one and a half of us. Cause I don't really, I, I'm not doing full AT. I get other responsibilities too. So I have a full-time speech language pathologist and whatever portion of my time I can weasel away for AT for the, for 30,000 kids. Oh, and those are your moments. Possibly because... new, move the needle forward. Right. I mean, you're, you're having yeah. these successes, both of you right? You're having successes. And now how does that get magnified? How do we amplify that? Going back to what Kelly says, you need an administrative champion now. Who's that person that's going to say, well, this is important work that has to keep happening. And how are we going to do that? Because it's not sustainable for you to do that with three people or one and a half people. Well, but there's also a push here. Like I, I can't take an, a teacher out of the classroom. Right. Like I can't take it. I don't have OTs to serve kids if I pull an OT away. I don't have another speech therapist to pull. We are already down. You know, my my speech path that does, she's actually not full-time AT because she's seeing kids part of a day to cover caseloads. So I mean, I think, I think the struggle is and that. and there's even a push in in other places for our math coaches, for other people to be back in the classroom teaching in place of long-term subs, which then takes away staff members who could be support. Like I do have some, some mentor coaches and some reading coaches that are really great about helping integrate technology into the classroom. But if I lose them as a support, that's more back on us to help support teams. So until we have staffing figured out, like I, I'm not asking for, for any, any, any other, like I it would be great to have a third person on our team. That would be amazing. We could absolutely use it because we have funded a a large amount of communication devices in our district this year. We're, we're one of the few districts in Florida that do that private work instead of just referring them to a private therapist to do it. Because um, we know from an equity perspective, a lot of our families don't have access to a private therapist. So we fund them, we help, we do that work to fund them, but we don't always have the time to go back and do that follow-up implementation as much and as well as we would like because there's only two of us. And can I just add this? Um, Orange County has lost two of their, um, uh, they're, like they're on part-time this year and they will be fully retired. They went part-time this year for as lats so that they could train people because we don't have, admin has said, you absolutely do not take SLPs out of the schools right now because we don't have enough SLPs. And guess what? If we were, if they were to recruit from another district, guess what happens? Because our um, because our situation in Florida is now that everyone gets a base of um, forty nine thousand dollars. If you hop districts, that AT position is a teach. It's like a it's an instructional position in the districts. So you could be making sixty because you've been in the system. Blah 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 blah. You hop to Orange County. Guess how much you get paid? $49,000. There is no, other than your master's, there is no recognition of any of your years. So they have literally, talk about admin being a champion, even if you have an admin champion, I hate to share all the barriers here, people, mm -hmm. but like, even if you have an admin champion, money, like you can't pay people. And then on top of that, you can't take them out of the classroom. So what they're doing is it's a systemic, it is, is, it is designing a system so that it can fail. And that's unfortunate. That's unfortunate. So we got to do with what we can. 
Yeah, that that, that very I real agree. world stuff that kind of cre- crashes in and, and onto all this is so calm. That happens to us all the time as we have this conversation. Go ahead, Lauren. Sorry, I stepped on you. Oh, that's okay. I was just going to agree 100% with Mia. We have a lot of like support issues around that. And we're trying to, you know, we've gone through many iterations. I was just saying in the chat, like I was just on this team one day a week. I mean, I've only been in this role eight, eight years full time, but years before that, it was like, I was one day a week. Oh, I was also the autism coordinator. I was an SLP seeing students, you know, kind of pulled into different things. Oh, Mm -hmm. personal learning devices. And you're like an AT technology implementation person, you know, just kind of muddied the roles or just, they just weren't even well-defined. They just all kind of smashed together. Right? Yeah, just, that's, that's just Lauren. You know, Lauren, she does that thing and she does that over there and that over there. And that's what we become. I think it's a very common, I don't, I was going to say problem. I don't know if it's a problem. It's, you know, Situation. That, that if you become all things to all people, then, it, and it's the space I find myself in. If somebody's like getting ready to introduce me before I'm going to do, they're like, what do you actually do? And I'm like, well, in this capacity today, I'm I am here, here to this. talk about this. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. But I'm also <laughs> the technical support for the building. And I'm also this, and I'm also this, and I'm also this. Yeah. I feel Mary Poppinsy when you look at my car. Um, the inside of my car is very Mary, Mary Poppinsy. Right. And, um, and, and I think it, it sometimes is, uh, it, it makes it more difficult for people to know who else to go to because then they just think, oh, Alyssa will take care of it. And a large portion of it falls under my purview, but um, but not all of it. And and it does become difficult when, you know, I, I can't put extra pressures on a classroom teacher or an SLP because right now we just we're, we're wanting to keep them happy. So sure. they return. Makes sense. Yeah. We, that took a turn towards the end, didn't it? Yeah. And what did we learn? We've learned there's a lot of conversation to still be had about this. We Listen, learned, I thought you just disappeared. All I saw was your background. We've learned that we yes. need to fight for Stayed education. Away. Like, I mean, if anything's going to change, we really all need to be actively involved in the fight for our our schools. Yeah, I, I, mean, yeah, I, I was going to ask you about the like position funding and like that kind of stuff because. Right now we're paid um, as teachers. We're on like the teacher scale, the same as SLPs. Everybody's like a big band, but it's only a 10 month position. And then we get paid these extra days, but doesn't go towards our like state retirement. We just get paid extra days. And so anyway, we have sort of a big shift ahead of us um, to Mm -hmm. sort of figure out when we have students in the building, it is a requirement that for ESY and summer school that they need access and accessibility and they need training and support because it's our students with their most complex needs, the ones who are qualifying for ESY and are the ones, that are the entire population that we work with, like 90% of them get some sort of assistive technology okay. for one reason or another. And so we're trying to advocate you know, that it needs to be more year round. And I don't know if anybody's done that, but I would be glad to pick your brain and talk about that in the future because I don't want to be a supervisor but that's what they keep saying like oh you have to be a supervisor and I'm like no 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 we actually have this thing where people are 12 month employees and they don't supervise other people but they're needed year round so can we be like them (laughs) but it's a lot of money so the school board of course you know has to review it and there's going to be a lot of scrutiny people throwing up barriers of no they're probably not going to work out yeah, it's all it about is. the money. Mia says it's like her. Yeah, I like that. Mia, that's your code. It's all about the money, money, money. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys, it's it's five after the hour. So I love sure. that. That's how we're going out. That's way I, better I, place I appreciate to go that. Out. That's how we go out, and I think that <laughs> yeah, made right. Me feel better about yeah. <laughs> So this is much better. It's a much better end. Rain and money. Uh, if only. Brian, look what you've done to our group. Are you happy with yourself? This is how we ended. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Excellent. Well. I, I love this conversation. It will keep going. If you if you haven't joined the the quiet book study yet on Facebook, do it. Um, if you haven't made a, um, a a routine of getting there, like Mia and myself, find a way to do that so you can participate. Mia, I'm going to challenge myself to be more involved in that group too. No challenge to you, just to myself. Uh, can you text me when you're challenging yourself? Sure. Maybe and you say, "Hey, I'm I need getting an on right now." Partner, <laughs> it's a deal. Um, everybody else will see you online and uh, 
uh, have a great rest of the week. Thanks for the happy conversation. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday yes. to you. Happy birthday, dear Alyssa. Happy birthday to you. Woo! Happy birthday, Alyssa. <laughs> That's impressive. Thanks. I will see you, uh, Mike, sometime later this week. Looking forward to it. See you later, Joan. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Thank you.